Okay, so our next uh, fantastic speaker for this afternoon is John Smith from the University of Westminster. And John has kindly uh, created a presentation for us covering forensic photography. So of paramount importance for people involved in crime scene education in HE, FE and in practice. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Lisa. Um, let me just find my thing and share the screen. Okay, can you see? Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Right. So yeah, let, let me know if there's any uh, difficulties with this as I go through. Um, so this is what I'm talking about this afternoon. Okay, so the content, who am I and what am I doing here? And then what does this talk about? And it's largely about a forensic photography module. And so what is the module about? Um, looking at some of the principles of the module, the approach to resources, timetable, activities and assignment and overall trying to build an online learning community and there's actually quite a bit of crossover I think um, between this and what we've heard already this afternoon. Um, so the first bit, who am I and what am I doing here? Um, I've been currently teaching both at the University of Westminster um, and for the last semester at the University of West London and although I was introduced as Westminster, it's the West London one that I'm really talking about this afternoon. Um, I teach on various courses at Westminster, um, but one of my main things this last semester has been, again, it's, it's, it's photography online, but to a very different crowd of students on a uh, arts-based course, contemporary media practice. And the way that I've been teaching both of these modules, has, there's quite a lot of similarities between them, okay? Um, previously, to my um, uni career, I was, I was an imaging specialist first at the Forensic Science Service and LGC Forensics, and I still currently do some independent forensic imaging work. So I've got some understanding of um, the industry, if you like. So, yeah, what does this talk about? Well, it's largely about the module Forensic Photography, which is a 20 credit level five module on the BSc Forensic Science course at the University of West London. And it was the first run of a new module, um, which ideally would have been a, a practice heavy module, but it's, it's still, it still sort of was, but we're doing it under COVID restrictions. So there's obviously um, not possible to go in on site. Um, I should give some thanks and acknowledgements to both Laura, Hugh, the course leader, and Brian Hook, um, who kind of helped me settle in a lot um, and helped me with lots of kind of the, the planning for the module and the assessments, etc. But when I started on this in, January, my to-do list included kind of putting the whole thing together in terms of the curriculum design, the module study guide, 14 weeks of lectures and practicals, um, and all the details to, to the assignment. So there's an awful lot that I could talk about, but I'm going to try and concentrate on um, you know, making the most of teaching and learning online under what we would have thought of as sort of far from ideal conditions. So the, the way I framed this module um, is to say it's about visual, it's the visual presentation of evidence or the presentation of visual evidence. And I'll leave it up to you to ponder the relationship and similarities and differences between those. Um, but it's largely about crime scene and evidential photography, um, looking at various types of scene, various types of evidence we might be photographing, recording, uh, various challenges that are associated with that. And we're looking at photography as a means of documentation, as a witness and a me as a means of communication. And this idea of kind of transporting and, and documenting the crime scene and following it through to the presentation of evidence in court. OK, um, and I, I, I shared these sort of two examples. This is one from an old colleague of mine working at LGC um, in, in the lab. And this is a photograph from a fingerprint bureau I visited in Australia a little while ago. And both of them show in sort of very different contexts the fact that the often the forensic practitioner who is working with the images isn't necessarily at the crime scene and they're not necessarily the person that is taking the photos. 
And I'm kind of just trying to reassure students and reinforce the point that a lot of forensic imaging is done remotely. And so this, um, it, you know, it, it helps frame what we're doing with um, students working remotely and the fact that we don't have access to the lab to say like your job largely is to be able to take these images uh, with suitable documentation and present them in a way that is understandable to an end user. Um, and so rather than saying that this is, you know, I'm going to make you a specialist photographer through this um, module, the way that I framed it is to say that if you think about the typical roles and jobs at the crime scene or at the lab, whether that's the, for the police or the forensic science provider, many of these roles require an, a, a competency in photography or an understanding of visual communication rather than the absolute kind of technical speciality of every aspect of operating a digital SLR camera, etc. So that's kind of how I, I was framing that module. Um, and to think about how I resourced it in terms of like textbooks, etc. Um, well, there's a lot of material to try and put together for a module which was going to be running online. And I'm not sure you know, how much of this will be carried forward into the future years. So I, didn't, I wanted to use existing resources as far as possible. Um, one of the first things I did is ask all of the students, what do you have access to? You know, what type of phone do you have? Assuming you've got a smartphone, your phone's got a camera. So they only got a list of responses for the students about what they had. I could then reassure them that, you know what, you've got a fantastic piece of um, equipment there, which is very versatile. Um, another thing was to, like, this is kind of simple, basic stuff really, but check the availability of online texts. So there are a number of different textbooks in the library, some of which required um, you to download software to view them, some of which had limited access that once you, you know, you could download a chapter at a time maybe, or something which was time limited. Um, but I decided to go for Robinson's Crime Scene Photography, um, largely because the whole thing is downloadable in a series of PDFs. Plus there's a lot of material which is available online. There are kind of questions and answers, uh, you know, quizzes if you like, for the, for the various different chapters. Uh, there's also some videos that are available online. Um, and I also used Nick Marsh's Forensic Photography a Practitioner's Guide. Again, there's a lot of online resources once you have a copy of the book. Um, all of the images from the textbook can be kind of downloaded as um, PowerPoint slides uh, from the support website. So that was good. Um, I was also looking at what's available on YouTube, and particularly an old colleague of mine, Tim and Coyle, um, has a series of really in informative videos uh, during which he was talking through some of the cases. Um, that, that we worked on together when, when I was back at LGC. So this stuff exists. So I was, I was trying to save myself some time and effort, and make it easy for the students to access uh, materials that are available. As far as possible, I put every, you know, all of the lectures are done via Blackboard Collaborate. All key documents um, for the module put as PDFs on Blackboard. I'll come on to OneDrive a little bit later, but I used OneDrive quite heavily for the students to upload their work to. Um, and then took a downloaded a copy so that I've got um, you know, something for my something for the archive that's as secure and provides me with ease of access. Um, it's Adobe Bridge. I come on to this a little bit later for the well, the work review. Um, and I thought it was important to pay a bit of attention to slide design, particularly at Westminster in the School of Arts. We've got a lot of students that um, have dyslexia and other kind of challenges with working online. Um, so I thought it's quite important to put a bit of attention to the slide design and the kind of overall look and feel um, for the module. Now then, um, ideally the, the, the original plan for the module was to run um, two short practical sessions each for half of half a class on a Thursday morning and Thursday afternoon and to do the lecture on a Friday morning. Whereas the decision I took was to, for the COVID era that under the full lockdown, um, I would do a online lecture to the whole class on a Thursday morning, followed by drop in tutorial support online. And if there are any questions or whatever following on from the, uh, from, from the lecture, I'd set them off to do a task on the Thursday afternoon and on the Friday, we'd have an online live work review and we'd, we'd go through their work. 
about halfway through the um, semester, the government restrictions changed and West London was keen to kind of get us back on site to do practicals. So I had to make some sort of major change to the plan halfway through. Um, now again, the original plan was to do two practical sessions, half the class in each. Now that was going to create difficulties with cleaning equipment and just the time management. Um, so what we did is to go for like a full sort of five hour session with a break for lunch uh, and alternate it half a class one week, half the next week. So it meant that the equipment could sit aside for a week without being touched. Um, and it made the kind of cleaning and the um, infection control a lot simpler. And we went back to um, a lecture or work review on the Friday. OK. So to outline some of the principles of the module, I've covered some of it already. But again, the way that I'm framing this and you, know, you might argue with this, but it worked for the for this last semester. I say like what makes photography forensic or forensic photography forensic? Um, it's a it's a lot of it is about following standard operating procedures, uh, photographs for a particular purpose, photographs for a particular end user. Um, I really stress the necessity to prove the provenance and veracity of photos at any and every stage from the crime scene to the court. You know, the provenance from where did the photo come? Veracity, is it accurate, truthful, reliable? And that includes not just the photograph, but the annotations and the captions that go along with the photograph. So, I, you know, I was constantly banging on about it. You, you need to make sure that you set the settings on the camera correctly, particularly the date and time. The importance of keeping written notes, sketches, making simple floor plans, etc., using appropriate digital file and, and folder structure for the for your images and resources, and ultimately to make sure that you can match your notes and your captions to the photographs uh, and be absolutely sure that you can prove you know, both the provenance and veracity of this. Um, and now we did this kind of through a series of tasks week after week throughout the module. So again, stressing the importance of the documentation of photography as well as the documentary photography. That every photo must be uniquely identifiable and traceable through its journey from the crime scene to the courts to the time, the date, the location, the person that took the capture, captured the photograph and the camera and other equipment via any image processing. So again, importance of notes, sketches, plans, etc. Um, and I was following largely the principles um, that are covered by Robinson in the textbook, you know, keeping a photographic log of the images um, as they're taken, making sketches and floor plans. Um, and this link to smart draw is actually something one of the students found for us. Um, this is this is from the textbook here, but it's an online um, freely available thing for making sort of plan sketches to put on labels where, where the photos were taken from. Um, in terms of resources, of course, most of the students are working with their own smartphone. So I was saying, OK, well, John, let's, let's go by the principle of it's not what you have, it's, it's how you use it that matters. And there are some advantages to using a smartphone camera. You know, the ease of use is an advantage. And by doing that, we can concentrate on the forensic principles and work within the limits of what the camera can do. Yeah, there's an argument to say that the the digital SLR camera um, is quite a complex piece of equipment and that complexity provides versatility, but it can be confusing. In order to get good results or the best results, you need to learn how to use many of the functions. And that takes time and practice and with a limited or initially not possi no possibility of going on site, um, you know, that, that, that wasn't really going to happen. Um, a significant limitation really of smartphone cameras is there's the lighting. Now, usually there's just a built in LED flash source which is close to the camera lens, which is far from ideal for a lot of the specialist photography like marks and traces. So that was quite a considerable limitation. So we worked as far as possible with what was available, ambient light. And I shared this picture with them in the first week to show this was, this was a 2013 paper on smartphone technology for fingerprint capture. And, you know, that was, was that eight, nine years ago now. 
as the phone's getting better all the time and this sort of demonstrates that again that's principle it's not really what you have it's how you use it and if you're aware of what can be done um, with a smartphone camera maybe you can be a little bit more active about this being a photography module with smartphones okay so activities um in week one i set them a very simple icebreaker activity and the purpose of this was that it was um low risk it was to try out the use of the shared folder for uploading work and from the second week i'll be asking the students to do some proper work and this was just a, a simple activity give us something to talk about on the friday work review as a way of introducing ourselves and communicating with images so the task there was just take a series of three images documenting Thursday afternoon and how they how the students interpreted that was entirely up to them. Um, I wanted them then to create a very simple PowerPoint um, in a format with a title page, the three images um, and you know, name it with their student name and upload it just to try out the, the system because it was a new system for all of us and then meet, meet in the Blackboard session on Friday to, to review the work. So it's a very kind of low risk activity. It wasn't assessed. Uh, really informal kind of meet and greet thing. Um, in week two, I did something which is a little bit more forensic, but again, it wasn't assessed. It was a way of um, easing them into the to use of the shared drive. So I was saying, you know, take a series of three to five images documenting a small item in location, for example, yeah, shoe, pen, mugs, mobile, including overall mid-range and close-up images following the basic principles outlined in the textbook uh, to take some notes make plan sketch um, showing the location of items and position where the image is taken and again so this is the kind of the bridge into the forensic uh, principles of photography and again create a simple powerpoint add your plan sketch add your images upload it to the shared drive meet in the blackboard session on friday to review the work. So that was the week two activity. Um, now, once we'd reviewed the work on the Friday, I could then sort of sit back and ponder it between then and the next Thursday lecture. And then in the next Thursday lecture, I give the kind of group feedback um, on how I thought the task went from the previous week. So in that first week, well, this was the first main task in week two, my thoughts were about roughly half the cohort submitted work, which was not bad in terms of engagement. I certainly wasn't expecting everybody uh, to do it. All of the students there were willing and able to discuss it, um, you know, put the microphones on, talk through the work. Um, the overall quality of the work in, the, in that week was very good to excellent. And some of the best things were you know, the engagement with the process, the level of discussion, the illustration of practical challenges, of a wide variety of scenes and this this was repeated in in following weeks when i got them to do specific kind of mock crime scene tasks if you like you know, so as we heard earlier it's all very well hearing and seeing what the textbook has to say but when you go into the scene and you can't get into position because the bed's there or the lighting from the windows or something is 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 not ideal how do you solve those problems and how do you kind of adapt what you've been told in the lecture to the specific challenges uh, uh, that you face so that was really good. Um, the demonstration of understanding was really good. The communication of visual evidence was really good. Um, and the things to improve were, you know, a few of the students didn't quite understand some of the key principles and the idea that by doing these work reviews, they would kind of learn from seeing other good examples, um, learn from, and, and, and we share like the smart draw uh, thing that one of the students found, you know, improved the, overall um, kind of quality of the, of the plans, for example. And we easily filled our two, our two hour session. Um, so that required some time management. And the thing that I did in the following weeks was to rather than kind of go through all of the as much as possible of the group work, I set the students into breakout rooms on Blackboard so that they're, dis they're discussing a smaller um, amount of work with each other and then kind of reporting back to the class uh, for the second half of the of, of the, of the, um, of the work review session. Um, and 
the week three activity was this is the first thing that would have led towards the final assessment for the module. Um, and this was to document an outdoor crime scene. When I say crime scene, so like find a location near to your home and it could even be outside of your home. Um, treat it as if it were a crime scene in terms of the documentary photography. Include at least one item of evidence, and this could be, you know, a shoe, a knife, or whatever you have, um, and follow the principles that we'd covered in previous modules. But by sorry, previous lectures, and by then we introduced some of these kind of key principles about the labels that go in the photos, the photo identifier to kind of show where and who, uh, sort of where you are and who was taking the images. The importance of labels, scales. Um, how to improvise if you don't have a ideal forensic scale. Um, how to decide, you know, when you've taken enough photos uh, or when you've taken too many photos. Okay, so this really depends on the type of scenario that they were uh, setting themselves. Um, we had a range of scenes that came in. You know, we had a street scene, we had garden scenes, we had exteriors of buildings, we had vehicles. So again, it's this fantastic resource that you can then use it in a work review uh, to say, like, talk us through your work. What are the challenges that you faced? How did you overcome them? Um, as well as the what are the strengths and weaknesses of your work or you know, what can be improved or what, what do you think you've done well? Um, and we had a range of evidence uh, types there. Uh, OK, and some of the best students went and included, you know, more than just the obvious. They might have included um, you know, some liquid dripping down the sink. They might have included, um, I don't know, damage to uh, a potential break in or, or something or other. OK. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this was leading on to what would be finally part of their coursework, which was a portfolio of three different tasks. One was a crime scene based task. Um, and the other two were kind of specialist uh, marks and traces. So the outdoor crime scene could have been one of their choices. Um, and my suggestion to them is, well, if you do it well, it's done. And if you did it not so well, you can learn from that process from the work review and do it again. That's the point of the of the work review. And the further activity, I won't go everything through everything in such detail, but in following weeks, we had an indoor daytime scene, we had an outdoor nighttime scene. Um, and I, was, I suppose I ought to say, like, I was careful to say you don't have to do the outdoor nighttime scene. Um, you know, there's obviously kind of you need to keep you careful of your students to say, not to say like you've got to go out at night with your smartphone camera wherever you are in London. I guess this, this, this is kind of optional. Um, in the week six and seven, finger marks and footwear marks, and later weeks, blood stains. Um, by the way, when it came to week six and seven, and 12 and 13. Some of this was done on site. So students that could go on site, we did on site practical activities. Students that couldn't come onto site for whatever reason, um, they continued in the kind of independent working. Um, and I got them to make up their own finger marks and footwear marks. Um, and that also, if they're making their own marks, they've got to understand what it is that they're photographing. So there's another level of Kind of understanding that you know, I'm, I'm hoping that they will demonstrate uh, through the preparation of their own samples here. So yeah, the, the final portfolio required for the assessment um, was a representative mix of this task, not every single task done to completion. Um, the Friday work review was, I, th I thought, one of the, the kind of critical things of the modules and one of the kind of highlights, if you like, um, for which you used um, Microsoft OneDrive, and I was new to this, but it, it, it worked fine. So if, you know, forgive me if this is basic stuff and you, and you know it, but it's just a way of having um, in a shared drive through the university system, so it's kind of secure in, in that regard, um, the materials. So the students would work remotely and then week by week upload their images or their PowerPoints into their own named folder under each week. And when it came to doing the on-site activities, I would download all of the 
images from the group and I would upload them um, so that everybody had access to them. And over the course of the module, we build up this kind of rich repository of work. Um, and then it allowed students to work remotely and down, download the images and view them. And so we've got the, the students named folders and inside the named folder for each week, you would have a set of images that they could then access. Uh, you know, other students could access it. They could view the work. They could see what others have done. They could see what was good, what was less good, what they missed. Um, and then our students can look at it kind of full screen, on screen, on screen. But for me, it was more useful to have Adobe Bridge on my laptop um, at home because it's just much easier navigating. So I would ask, or often ask the students to kind of select so like maybe three representative images from their set, um, give me the file names and I could kind of just highlight those images and go through them using Adobe Bridge and it made it much quicker to kind of enlarge the images, navigate them. Um, and then these are really useful because we can start looking at, say, for example, I mean, there's some sort of blood spatter on a wall, but once you enlarge the image, you can start looking at how the, how the contaminant uh, interacts with the surface. Uh, this is particularly useful for sort of finger marks and finger marks and footwear marks. Um, so you can sort of use the work that the students have created themselves as a kind of rich teaching and learning resource. And I'm hoping that because they've created a lot of the content, they've got some kind of investment into one, doing it well, um, and then two, kind of engaging in the discussion that comes along, along from it. Um, so just to end, because I'm fully aware of the time, um, just a couple of pros and cons. I thought the pros are this worked really well for those, particularly those that are engaged throughout the module. Uh, I could keep continuous eye on the students learning and provide ongoing feedback. Um, and they could engage in this kind of iterative process of producing some work, getting feedback, maybe going off, repeating it and improving it, but also like building on one task as it led to the other. And of course, the downside is that for students that for whatever reason didn't engage, um, they kind of, some of them really kind of struggled in um, putting everything together for the portfolio. Because uh, it was quite a lot of work to do the, the whole kind of portfolio for the, for the module. And if they'd missed some of the key sessions or they didn't um, attend the work reviews, then they were a, kind of a, a significant um, disadvantage. So that's something you know, we, we need to um, yeah, consider for future runs of the module. So I'm just about 26 minutes. I'm done, but please feel free to get in touch um, at my probably best to Channel at the Westminster email, uh, and I'll end it there and say thanks for your attention. Thank you, John. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, we have a lot of people in practice, HE and also FE, so I think your step-by-step -step approach to that module will be invaluable for any um, educators um, out there. We have got so many questions to ask you, um, so I'm going to kick it off straight away. Um, we really like the fact that you did a survey with students asking them about equipment that was available to them. Um, what diversity of equipment did they have um, to use? Did you find from the survey? Um, uh, I'm, I'm laughing, right, because this is my phone. I, I use like a, a little old school Nokia, right? Um, and even this thing is reasonable. But no, most of the students had surprisingly good up-to-date uh, smartphones. Um, some of the students even have digital SLR cameras themselves. So if they had that, I could say, well, yeah, use use what you have if you're happy and efficient yeah. with using it. But yeah, almost well, no, every student that at least responded to that survey had a decent quality, recent model smartphone. So I could then go online, of course, and look up the specifications, just like check you know, yeah. how many pixels, what uh, file formats, um, whether it's got one lens or two lenses, whether because some of these have got a, uh, a wide angle and a something mm. which is more suitable for close-ups. Um, yeah. And um, I think from both the presentations today, we've seen the importance of um, encouraging students and reassuring them. And I really obtained that from your presentation as well, the, the importance of reassurance and giving them confidence. And you mentioned low risk. And I thought that was 
really lovely the approach to because obviously when we first meet students they're getting to know us they're getting to know the subject area so I thought that was a really novel approach um, that you had and also it was really inclusive for everybody so um, one of the questions in the um, chat is um, did the students who didn't submit any any of the work, you know, when you did your formative sessions, did they give any reasons why they didn't? Were they worried about other people looking at their work? No, um, I imagine there's a range of reasons. Um, yes, I mean, and I don't I don't like to make any assumptions if the student can't engage, because I know that they're trying to, you know, everybody's struggling through the COVID situation. Um, yeah, some people have got families, some have got their own access, you know, issues to do with online, um, you know, trying to video stream live things that isn't an option for everybody, particularly if they're in shared accommodation, the rest of it. So I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I know some students would turn up to the Friday work review, even though they haven't submitted work, and that's fine. Um, not everybody could attend both the Thursday and the Friday, that's fine. Um, one thing I didn't do, I didn't record the Friday sessions because I thought it's important that students are not continually recorded and to allow them, you know, just that just that reassurance that this isn't being recorded and saved for others. And also to encourage them to turn up and engage because if things are always recorded, then they think, oh, I, I can look at it later. Yeah. And there's not an ideal answer to that, I don't think. I agree. I think it's the approaches you've taken were really supportive. So like you said, you still encouraged the students to attend even if they hadn't submitted work. So they obviously felt very supportive and, and safe in the online environment. Um, so I just think the whole process you've taken, you've, you've created this formative feedback and peer review discussion on a, a new subject area, which people sometimes find um, challenging from the, from the start. And I really like you referred to some technology there. So the Adobe Bridge, I'm not familiar with that. So I think a lot of people will find oh, okay. that it's very it, interesting. Adobe Bridge, it's, it, 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 if, you, if you have access to Adobe Creative, Creative Cloud, I think it's called now, oh, but yeah. Adobe Soft, it's something which is packaged alongside Photoshop. Um, and in one in one respect, it's just a very fancy file browser, which is much more easy for navigating images. It makes it does more than that, but yeah, you know, I have it on my laptop. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And we've got a, a question here: Are you implementing the self-reflective aspects as a marked part of the assessment, the portfolio, or um, will you continue using it as a development tool? Um, well, one of the things that I asked them to do as part of their portfolio to include the images, but also include uh, you know, an evaluation of those images. So I, I want the students to be able to kind of communicate that they understand what they've done well uh, and why they've done it well, or if it's not ideal, then what they could do to improve it. Um, everyone say an excellent talk and approach, John. Um, and there's another idea in the chat was uh, someone as an icebreaker, they asked their students to photograph what they thought a CSI was, what they thought a scene was, and then that gave them an idea of some of the misconceptions and expectations. And um, yeah, we all think that the approach you've taken is so supportive and that it's really important for us to appreciate people's prior knowledge and build this into our session design so that, you know, it's really, really important to reassure people, isn't it, and give them confidence rather than making assumptions. So yeah, brilliant approach. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think I, I agree with what, what others have said too. Um, unfortunately, there is, I think there is an assumption on the part of some students about what forensic photography is. Um, and some students, I think, felt a little bit like hard done by because they weren't dressing up in the overalls and going in with the yellow markers etc um you know i was always trying to encourage them to think it's not you know, this thing about it's not what you have it's how you use it and problem solving improvising you know how to respond when you're facing a new scenario which you weren't expecting they are some of the most valuable things as a practitioner 
Absolutely, and I really liked in your um, layout of the, the module weeks by weeks how you built on their knowledge, so that reinforced what they did and then it challenged them. So you did daylight photography and then nighttime photography and they're obviously key components of the accreditation. So um, really fantastic module. Thank you so much for presenting and sharing it with us. You're welcome. Really, really honoured. Thanks uh, to you and thanks to all the other presenters that have gone in, in the previous talks. It's been really interesting seeing how everybody is approaching this last year, you know.